Thank you very much. Uh, this evening, I want to take us beyond the edge of the sea. So we are going to go um, to, to beyond where you usually think about. Normally, if you look at a sea, a picture like this, this Pacific Ocean we've been sitting on, you look at the surface and you don't see beneath it. And also, when we look at the planet, we see the surface and we say three quarters of the planet is covered by water. But in fact, it's more than 95% of our biosphere, where organisms live, are in the deep sea. This is a huge part of our planet, and it matters. And it's also a place where you should care. This is a cartoon from 1983, 1983 in, the New, in the New Yorker magazine. I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the sea, but I don't. Um, this is a pervasive view, because I think we don't really understand what's down there. What is down there can be really stunning. Glorious animals, very exquisite in design, very graceful in their motions. Things you just want to know more about, right? So you see these animals, you look on the seafloor, you see creatures that are unrecognizable. Well, okay, octopus, you'll recognize that guy. Uh, but there's some animals here in these videos that I've, I can't tell you what that thing is, for instance. So um, we have the now the ability to access the deep sea. We can take beautiful pictures. The cameras now that we have can zoom in and look at tentacles and tentacles of tentacles and see details that my eyes can't see. So it's a spectacular world. It's a chance to really understand what's going on in the sea the way we can do that now, the way we never could before. I am a deep sea biologist. I study mostly the animals that live at hot springs on the seafloor on these mid-ocean ridges. Mid-ocean ridges are places where the Earth is or ocean crust is spreading apart, and they are volcanic systems. Pretty much any time, any day, there's a volcanic eruption going on somewhere in the ocean, in the deep water, maybe more than one eruption. They just happen all the time down there. So it's a very dynamic kind of um, geological setting. And this heat that drives the mountain ranges, that causes the rock to be buoyant, also moves is, is the plates are moving apart, and th those rocks become fractured and fissured. Seawater can percolate down through there, gets heated up by the hot rock, comes out on the surface of the seafloor as black smoker chimneys. So these are hot springs on the seafloor, black smoker chimneys, and they are the submarine analog of terrestrial hot springs, of geysers. They are pretty spectacular to see, very primordial looking. Temperatures, 350 degrees Celsius coming out of here. They're so hot, they're sterile, nothing can live there. Okay, so who cares about that? Except that sometimes, often, in fact most places, they're leaky. And we see things like bacteria. Okay, bacteria, well, these are actually pretty special because you can see those. There's no microscope here. It might have been a zoom on the camera, but these are macroscopic. You really can see them with your naked eye, big creatures. These animals are primary producers in these systems. So they're living in this area where warm water is flowing up, they're getting chemicals, um, and they are like green plants on land, but instead they're primary producers making, making organic material um, without sunlight. <laughs> so what they're doing is taking chemicals from the warm water coming up from the seafloor, the sulfide, and then they're mixing that with the oxygen. This is happening in the bacterial cell. That creates cellular energy, ATP, and that's what the uh, microbes are feeding on. That's how they grow and multiply. They get that nutrition. So this is chemosynthesis. The idea of chemosynthesis has really changed the way we think about the origin of life on our planet. And um, in fact, we think that at hydrothermal vents right now, there are the clays that make membrane-like uh, sy systems, there are proton pumps, there are protochemicals, protobiotic, prebiotic chemicals that are part of the system that could have, where life could have originated. In fact, some of us think that life may be originating right now at hot springs, but we can't, we don't see it because it's being et, it's being eaten by the organisms that have evolved over time. Uh, so it's really interesting from thinking about origin of life and also thinking about life on other planets so and, and planetary bodies. So chemosynthesis, so using chemical energy instead of sunlight, that opens up a whole range of extreme environments that we see in the solar system and, and the universe um, that organisms could have evolved, used to evolve. Back on Earth, we look at these high, uh, hot springs on the seafloor, giant tube worms are the iconic animals. So they're blood-red plumes, 
um, really very beautiful in life. They get eaten by other things. These two worms are tall. They can be as big as me. They can be about you know, an inch or so in diameter. They have no mouth, no digestive system. So the big puzzle when they were discovered was how do they eat? In fact, they have bacteria inside of them. And so the same kind of bacteria that are autotrophic, that are primary producers. So the two worm eats the bacteria and it delivers through that red plume the chemicals that the bacteria need to eat on. I want uh, those two worms occur on the East Pacific Rise, on the mountain range there, the hot springs on the East Pacific Rise. I want to just show you on a, the next slide um, some of the variation that we see. We have a biogeography of vent ecosystems. They're not the same animals everywhere. So we'll t take a quick look at the Scotia Arc, the Central Indian Ridge, the Southwest Pacific back arc systems, and the hydrothermal vents of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Just a couple of still photographs to show you some of this variety. Uh, there in the top left, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of crabs. Um, there's scaly foot gastropods, mussels, shrimp on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And I want to talk a little bit about the shrimp. They're pretty darn cool. These guys swarm over the black smoker chimneys. They're there in the thousands, 1,500 per square meter. They, um, unlike the tube worms, they do have a normal digestive system, but it, they have their bacteria on the outside. They're basically farming the bacteria and picking them up with their mouth parts and stuffing the bacteria in their mouths. So they're feeding that way. But what's particular about these guys is they don't have eye stalks, black beady little eyes. Instead, they have these patches on their back, organs, underneath their carapace that are um, adapted for detecting a very dim source of light. So they have no optics, they have a whole lot of rhodopsin. It's a big expanded eye derived from a normal shrimp's eye, but designed for detecting dim light. What kind of dim light can be down there? Uh, we thought about it and we thought that, well, black smoker chimneys, 350 degrees Celsius is what the temperature comes out at. Hot things glow, I sometimes think very simply. <laughs> Hot things glow, maybe these glow. Um, and we were able to go down with a, this is quite a while ago now, uh, what at the time was a very sensitive uh, camera, like what you have in your cell phones now. Your cell phone's probably better than what we used. And this is a picture taken of a black smoker with uh, flashlight. And then we turned out the lights on the submarine and took a picture. This is ambient light on the seafloor. So there is light on the seafloor, light in the deep ocean. Uh, and we think the shrimp are using this light to navigate. Black smokers, um, also have, they, the minerals have um, deposited around black smokers. In some geological settings, these uh, deposits can accumulate. So they become large enough to be of interest for uh, mining. And Jules Verne, he was prescient. He said, in the ocean depths, there are mines of zinc, iron, silver, and gold, which would be quite easy to exploit. And that's where we're at now, is thinking about how to exploit minerals on the seafloor, these minerals, including minerals from these hot springs on the seafloor. We have to think about this. We like our technology. We're a very metal-driven society. No matter where you are, we need metals. And uh, that's pr going to be true into the foreseeable future. So how do, we s how do we service that supply? The quality of the ores are degrading on land because they've been used. Uh, and the ores in the, on the deep ocean may be good, may be high, pretty high. So I want to sh show you what one deposit looks like on the seafloor of the Tag Mound. It's in international waters. It's under the jurisdiction of the International Seabed Authority, which is making, currently writing up the regulations for seabed mining and environmental management of mining. Uh, it's an organization set up to facilitate mining at the same time that it is to protect and preserve the marine environment. So we'll take a look at the Tag Mound. This is exactly the place where the swarming shrimp were first discovered. This is at 3,600 meters. If we look at it in a map view, look at its bathymetry, it looks like a little sticky bun on the seafloor. And um, in terms of dimension, it's small. Hydrothermal vents are not big places. This is only about two the size of two football fields in diameter. And it's basically a lens of sulfide metal. This is what the miners want to go after when they talk about going after seafloor massive sulfides. These kinds of systems occur on land. They've been brought up from the seabed and to land. So this Kid Creek mine is a, is a hydrothermal vent deposit. So when you think about mining on the seafloor, you can get this picture. You don't have all the land-based uh, infrastructure because it's all going to be done by a ship, but you have this big hole in the ground. It's open, open cut mining, basically. In the Southwest Pacific, Nautilus Minerals is a mining company, first mover company. 
They are a Canadian company working out of Brisbane, planning to mine in the waters of Papua New Guinea. They have a number of lease sizes, e uh, exploration leases, that's what you see on this slide. And they currently have a mining lease that they received in 2011 from the government of Papua New Guinea to mine the Sawara One uh, hydrothermal vent site. Sawara One, that Sawara means uh, saltwater and pigeon. So the Sawara One is slated for mining. They hope to be mining there in um, 2018, the first half of 2018, so just a couple of years from now. Here's what, how they plan to do it. This is their vision. They have a surface mining vessel and they lower ROVs, remotely, operate, remotely operated vehicles, to the seabed. Those mining tools, their mining tool ROVs, they chunk up the seafloor, grind it up, send the material up through a rising lifter system to the ship. The material gets dewatered. That dewatered material is filtered and sent back down to the seabed. The machines are big. They're already constructed. Um, and uh, like I said, they'll be going into the water, hopefully, in, well, hopefully from uh, Nala's view in 2018. The picture you saw on the mine site shows it looks kind of like a desert, right? It's, but in fact, there are animals that live there on the, sea f on the um, hydrothermal vent chimneys. So there are snails and barnacles, uh, crabs and the whole, uh, the bacteria from the bacteria all the way up to the top consumers. So Nautilus Minerals and the other mining industries come to the sci scientists and say, well, how do we think about this? How do we uh, do the environmental management in these kinds of systems? Uh, and we've been helping them think about that. And some of the things we have to think about are, you know, as scientists, we don't want to advocate for or against mining. But we want, if mining is going to take place, then we have to figure out how can they do it best. So we think about where the protected areas should be that make sense, that are strategic, that allow the organisms to persist. We think about what kind of baseline data do you have to collect beforehand. We think about what kind of monitor monitoring do you do. What's a significant adverse impact? How do you define that? So all the kinds of legal and environmental management uh, concepts you need. We think about how do you mitigate? What are, what are the ways to minimize the damage of mining? And even more challenging to think about is how would you possibly restore something that's a mile, mile and a half, two miles, three miles down in the ocean? Very challenging, very... Um, Intellectually rich, but challenging and, um, yes, interesting area to work. So I've, I've talked to you a little bit about the scientific value of the seafloor massive sulfides and hot springs. I've talked to you a little bit about the commercial value. And I wanted to just bring in the idea of um, how we think about the deep sea and, and this con cultural construction of aesthetic value in the deep sea. It's up to us to make these systems valued. It, it just doesn't happen. It's, it's not an innate character of the systems. It's human values that uh, need to be placed on them. I had a student who thought about this um, uh, looking at text from media as diverse as BuzzFeed all the way up to New York. Uh, up, uh, that's, sub that's imposing my m opinions, but <laughs> <laughs> including the New York Times. Um, and the words that kept up, the emotive words that were repeated over and over again were alien, strange, unknown, and mysterious. This is how we think of the deep sea. Um, and then the artwork that goes along with this, this cultural construction, we often see the lantern fish the, 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 that are so strange and eerie. Or uh, here's another picture of them going after the rubber ducks that fell in the water, the woodcut. Um, here's a different way of looking at organisms on the seafloor, face painting as a way to bring awareness to what's going on in the, in the deep sea. This was in the case of um, deep water trawling. Uh, the last example I want to give you is of a, uh, the Yeti crab. This has become a, an icon of the deep sea. It was actually discovered on an Alvin dive that I led, and I, but I didn't discover this crab. My, my colleague Michelle Sekonzak on the dive discovered it, found it, made sure we collected it, brought it up. It became, it's a new family of crabs, and it has become uh, really a special animal in the deep sea world. This is some uh, rather menacing uh, perspective, interpretation of this crab uh, by Lily Simonson, very, very well-known uh, oil painter. And then uh, in another extreme, <laughs> they have been turned into little plush stuffed animals that you kind of want to put around your neck when you're on the airplane trying to get a nap. Um, so I just want to close. I have two things I wanted to close with. The first is that these are trilobites. They're probably not going to be trilobites alive on the seafloor. They've been extinct for hundreds of millions of years. But they capture, for me, the idea that 
we don't know what we're going to find yet. We have not explored all the ocean by any means. And there's many amazing things out there to be discovered. If it's not a trilobite, it's going to be something else really, really strange and wonderful. And then the second thing is we as a society may choose to exploit minerals on the seafloor, but it's also then our responsibility if we do that. It's our responsibility to understand what we will lose as well as what we will gain. Thank you.